Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome to the Investing Stuff You Should Know podcast, where we bring you expert insights into the world of investing and beyond. My name is Johnny Nelson, and today, guess what? I am the host, and I am the guest. This is a little bit of a new format for me. I'll be doing this occasionally just to share some insights of what uh, we have going on in the fund space, uh, in our own properties. So it's just high time that we shared some of that knowledge that uh, uh, myself, my team, uh, are, are doing and experiencing ourselves. So it's, it's gotta be fun. It's gotta be fun. Today, we're going to be talking about diversification and, uh, that's a fancy word that a lot of us talk about, but what does it mean in terms of the real estate, the real estate space? So we know, well, we're going to get, again, we're just going to jump right into this and uh, deliver value and see where this goes. So we know that we can diversify by asset class. And that's a very fancy word, just different property types. So what are a few out there that we can discuss and talk about? Well, we have residential, single family home. Most of us live in a home or many do, many, many rent. Uh, we have commercial space, like office spaces, retail outlets, and warehouses. Uh, we have industrial. Uh, we Maybe if you drive out to the edge of your city, perhaps you've seen if you're in a larger area, uh, massive uh, block after block or field after field of industrial space being developed. Those are from reshoring, uh, warehousing, uh, just sustaining uh, America. There was kind of a, a gap uh, kind of over COVID. There's been a kind of a delay in development that really got a lot of investor capital. Hospitality, there's another asset class or another kind of building. Uh, hotels, motels, resorts, That those can be uh, an investable asset. And then we have specialty. Uh, specialty could include student housing uh, all the way up to, you know, even, even senior living community. So all these are, they're all real estate, but they have their own unique challenges, their own unique upsides. And every uh, real estate asset class, there's a business within a business. I mean, it's just, you know, I saw this uh, online the other day, essentially it's it basically, it's a business disguised as a building. Uh, I just love the way that's that's phrased. So <clears throat> within, of course, we talked about the different asset classes. Now let's talk about another way of diversifying. So the whole the whole podcast will focus on what does diversification mean and how can you diversify um, as a portfolio manager or as a fund manager or maybe a syndicator. And there's pros and cons to either side. Um, some people really, really get to know their market. I know operators that just focus in you know North Carolina or Houston, Texas or Phoenix, Arizona. And they leverage that in their intimate knowledge. They maybe they grew up there or they moved there and they really know the area. They like the market. They know all the players. They know the contractors, all those things. And it gives them an edge in, from that perspective. However, there's a downside to that as well. And you have, if there's a, you know, an economic uh, downturn that it especially impacts that region, hopefully the region is has a diversification of uh, jobs and, you know, from an economic perspective, hopefully there's some finance and then maybe there's some manufacturing and there's some um, hospitality where people want to visit there. So if you have a diverse range of uh, economic activities there, that can help soften the blow if there's a dip, you know, let's just say in the financial market, like there is right now with, you know, uh, financing uh, interest rates being high. So there's going to, it's going to put some pressure on the financial market. So, um, so that's like that. That's, that's geographical diversification, if you would. So that's uh, maybe I just, like I said, maybe I just focus in in Phoenix uh, and, you know, maybe there's concerns about water supply, but then also it's a, it's an amazing market. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people moving there, a lot of growth, a lot of, it's a very business friendly state, business, business friendly city. And then there's, you could have regional diversification. So that's like, you know, local diversification, regional diversification, and even, you know, we get I don't go too fancy here, but even international diversification. So if you're a large, large player, maybe you invest uh, some some uh, in motels in Hong Kong, hotels in you know LA, and then maybe even go into Europe as well. So that's like the very broad scale. The scale that I and a lot of my associates play out, it's it's focused in the U.S. and it typically it's within an asset class, and you know oftentimes we'll focus within um, you know again one market. Or there could be multiple markets, you know, maybe, um, you know, uh, let's go with uh, Reno, Nevada, Boise, Idaho, and uh, Portland. You know, maybe it's kind of a Northwest U.S. type of play or maybe even into Montana. So that can be another way to hedge or to uh, make sure that you're not going to be too uh, subject to some geographical impacts 
uh, let's pick a, a natural disaster. Let's just, just let's just say we we're you were invested in uh, Denver and or the Denver area, the Colorado area. There's wildfires. We know that there was uh, some massive wildfires in the region in the area. I forget the city right now, but we know those in fires caused about a billion dollars of damage. Clearly, subject you know nature has a say in markets, <laughs> so we can't ignore that. And if we're just invested in Denver or the Denver region. Uh, perhaps we're overly exposed to, you know, uh, fire risk. So, uh, but we also know that there's beautiful, beautiful country. Of course, clearly, you know, uh, pl plenty of areas were not impacted by the fire, but it's something to consider in, in from a geographical perspective here. We have another area of diversification, and that's how are we going to basically buy into or be part of these assets, you know, how can we, you know, my, my, I'm just, I'm not just going to show up and, you know, slap down a hundred, I know like a thousand dollars, something like that. I have to go into it with the vehicle. I have to be part of the operating team, which could be a joint venture or JV for short. It could be a fund. I, uh, oh, I operate a real estate, a 506C fund that's for accredited investors only. Um, there's other kinds of funds that can take accredited and non-accredited investors. There's a definition for accredited. We're not going to talk about that today, but just to know that that's also uh, very real and you know that can also be uh, very handy. There's benefits to going with a accredited, non-accredited. Again, that's something else. We have, uh, again, within the idea of diversification of investment vehicle, we have REITs, real estate investment trusts. These are more or less operated as stocks, but they have to distribute. There's other upsides and downsides. They're very liquid, but also they have to distribute. I think it's 90% of their uh, revenue or their income every year. So it's really not a long-term play. You're not uh, really part of the, you don't really get the upside of uh, the equity play of the equity build um, as, if, as if you went into the deal as a LP limited partner or as a JV. So there's there's downsides to that, but they're very liquid. You can You can come in and out like a stock. And then of course, you just have direct ownership. Hey, a lot of us own a house and that's also a way to purchase real estate. So again, just kind of a high level there, diversification of an investment vehicle, you could have direct ownership, real estate investment trust, real estate funds or joint ventures. And there's other ones beyond that, but we're just kind of touching the high level. So what is kind of the guidelines for do we just does one just like come up with some stuff and like i heard that diversification is good and we should uh do more of that well that sounds rather uh non-informed uh there's certainly some some guidelines to that we consider in why we would want to diversify and the, the guidelines for what kind of diversification, we don't want to just do it for its sake, because we heard someone say on TV that you should do that. But some of the things we consider is risk management. Understand, we want to understand the risk profile of each asset. For instance, core assets in prime locations might be less risky than opportunistic investments in emerging markets. We want to do market research basically continually. So that's something else again, uh, you know, we want to continuously understand where our market is and if there is softening or weakening uh, or, well, that's actually too negative or growth. Let's go with the positive side. We want to be able to get ahead of that. Maybe we see an opportunity or an area that's going to, that's about to receive some major investment at a state or federal level or regionally. And we want to be a part of that. Maybe they're going to put some manufacturing in the Southeast. And we, 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 are, we are anticipating a car manufacturing plant or, you know, a data center going somewhere. We want to be getting in on that area if possible. Um, we have liquidity considerations. That's something else that's many people maybe don't think about a lot. Are we going to need that capital sooner than later? Or what is our time horizon that we might want to consider that getting access? So if you need short, you know, your capital, rather you know quickly or you don't really want to commit uh, a long time perhaps you know we could step outside the real estate space and say hey maybe a stock is better for you or a you know a shorter term bond or like we just talked about perhaps a REIT is a good option so that's where we have liquidity but that's also the upside of the longer hold where you lock your money in as an investor whether it's you know like you don't just like buy and sell you, you could, but typically people, it's it, the transactional costs are high. You don't buy your, you don't buy a personal residence and sell it within a year. You don't buy uh, a large, you know, commercial property as a JV and typically flip it in a year. Nor if you come in as in a fund or a syndication, you are you in and out in a year. These things are typically 
not exclusively, but typically a three to five year horizon. And you're oftentimes not necessarily in control. It's either a joint agreement with your partners, or if you're a limited partner, you are basically forego the right to make those decisions. Trust the GP or the general partners, the lead team and say, yes, you guys are, are half your best, everyone's best interest in mind to make those decisions when to sell, when to sell is dependent on a lot of things, but I guess we'll set that aside for another time. So again, circling back to what are we talking about here? The guidelines for the kinds of diversification that we might want to consider. Uh, again, that's risk management, market research, liquidity cons uh, considerations. Um, and then of course, just general, just kind of knowledge of what the, the market is doing. There's a lot of factors that can play into this and the seasoned, the old wise owls out there that have been doing this a long time, can they will and can and have a list of criteria that they that they use themselves uh, to not get caught, you know, with, uh, you know, not having considered these things uh, in their, their own portfolio. So um, I just would, and I can just share the, my own uh, approach of late as my fund grows. And again, like I started out the conversation with, uh, so we are in the Phoenix market. I mentioned the Phoenix market. I think the Phoenix market is tremendously strong. We can see from a geopolitical perspective, and here is my own, some of my own analysis. I'm not going to go through the full thing, but just some of the considerations that, that I consider or that I bring, we see obviously just like the growth of the, the, the region uh, very, very robust, you know, as far as people moving there, homes being built, multifamily being built, manufacturing, and something that's been exciting, but less, I mean, kind of, it's also kind of concerning at a geopolitical level. Let's talk about China. And you're like, whoa, what are we talking about China for? So um, at the world stage, uh, there's been a lot of tension between the US and China. And within the part of that crossfire, if you would, that diplomatic and, and political crossfire, that tension is uh, the manufacturing of silicon chips. It's a, it's a huge industry across the world. And some of the best chips are made in Taiwan. And of course, we know that Taiwan is disputed you know, or has been disputed the territory with China for a long time. The U.S. sees that as a, a real risk to our national security. So they have been uh, investing or pushing investments and allow, allowing federal money to be available to manufacturers. Some of them are Taiwanese-based, like you know, tele, um, TSMC is a giant Taiwanese semiconductor manufacturing corporation. They are actually building some massive plants uh, or additional plants in the Phoenix region. And uh, the Intel is there. Obviously, they make chips and they have been for a long time, but there's other companies that are also investing in the region. So we see that kind of focus and growth and money being invested in a region. You know there's going to be long-term stability, relatively long-term, you know, uh, five to 10 years stability at least uh, in, uh, in a region. And how can we be, how can as investors, we partake of that, that federal money, the, the technical talent that's going to come with that. And it's certainly these 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 uh, the commitments that they're making these companies and the government are not light commitments. We're not talking like a tent town. We're talking like multiple hundred billion dollar plants. These things are massive, highly specialized, highly technical, and they will the 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 people that are making these investments are committed for a very long term. So, if you can be part of that wave, then that's something else. That's something you definitely want to consider in your investment strategy. And there's other areas of the country. That sim, you know, other like manufacturing automobiles or electric vehicles, that these things are happening as well. So I'm not saying this is the only way, but it's simply a big consideration. So that's one of all the different things we talked about. Uh, you know, asset class, um, liquidity, uh, population growth, demographics. <laughs> this is just like an additional thing that I consider myself. Another area that we've invested in is the Dallas region. Dallas is a uh, giant, a giant area. It's growing. There's many, many reasons why, you know, why the Texas market uh, more broadly, but then also the Dallas market is uh, very, very robust. Uh, nearly 400 people move there every day. That's just astonishing. Um, and it, those mainly that growth has, has been coming from California and uh, mainly from California, but also a few, uh, some people from the East coast as well. Uh, Florida gets more of the New York people, but a lot, a lot of people are moving down there. Uh, my family, uh, myself and my family are considering to moving or actually will be moving down there ourselves uh, in a very short time frame. So, you know, we have, if you just want to like uh, take, take a few a few metrics, um, over 200 businesses have relocated down there. 
the giant um, Caterpillar, um, you know, heavy equipment manufacturer Caterpillar was in Chicago. This I think believe this happened last year, and then they relocated to to Dallas. And we've had other large, large corporations uproot from their long-term area that they have worked on or been part of and move to Dallas because it's a fairly uh, business-friendly area. Um, however, there's a kind of a mix in there, which is attractive to some people where, but oftentimes, now we're going to talk politics for just a bit here. The, basically, you have the state being red, uh, more or less Republican, very business-friendly, but then also you have the city, some at least the city cores being more aligned with uh, Democrats, more blue, but then they provide a lot of services that people enjoy, they like. So how can you kind of get the best of both of those worlds? You have a red state with like blue, big blue dots in there. These, country, these uh, companies from around the country have seen that like, hey, this is incredible. We can be part of the rather, you know, the tax benefits and the, the, less, the less strict uh, labor regulations and some other things but go to these giant cities or these large cities where people want to live. So they uh, have seen that advantage. And like I said, many, many companies have moved there. Why are we talking about companies? Because companies bring jobs. People want to be part of, want good jobs. They want to be uh, on the econ economic upswing. And when they have jobs, then they can pay for housing. They can pay for good housing. And again, tying this back to investors, again, all the, we go through all those other things, but this is kind of like the foundation. We need people, we need people that are getting employed, people that have good job prospects and they want to live in an area. So all those things kind of taken together and there's, there's others, but that's just kind of give you a sample of some of the things that I look at when we invest in a region or in an area, whether it's a development, which we're working on uh, within the fund or, or other elements of, of investing as well. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I think that's probably a good wrap for this conversation about diversification. And uh, I encourage you to um, consider uh, when you, if you're maybe a limited partner, maybe a, a passive investor, to consider that within your own portfolio. Are you part of a team that believes in that as well? And are they diversified in, in area, in region, in asset class? And also maybe if you are savvy, you would like, you can spread your own money around the country where you have maybe an opportunity to invest with uh, a few uh, sponsors, a few uh, areas. And you, if you were uh, for the more bold or the bolder, you could even go into maybe a few alternative asset classes. So you could be in multifamily, uh, self-storage, and maybe industrial. And they're again, kind of tying back to our, when we started off the conversation, the reasons you would try to diversify in those other asset classes is they are somewhat, not completely, somewhat decoupled from each other. So self-storage um, did uh, pretty well or has done pretty well, for example, throughout most economic cycles. It's not the highest return. It's not wildly, it doesn't swing up wildly uh, like multifamily can. Multifamily was doing, did really fairly well uh, pre-COVID. It took a hit kind of during COVID with all the, the, the rental distress, if you would. And, and now we have the uh, the high interest rate. So, you know, they there's a little bit of decoupling there. They're not exactly co correlated. And industrial is also tied back to uh, the Americans just wanting a lot of things and also reshoring, kind of talking about China again, reshoring some manufacturing, warehousing, and some other production back from the state, um, in, from, uh, the, from overseas to the U.S. So again, kind of a decoupling from exactly what, one from the other. So that's that can be very strong, can be very powerful, and can ensure that overall your portfolio has consistent returns. So that's what we're trying to do is not be overly exposed to one type of economic uh, event. We want to have a exposed to different, we're going to be exposed to a lot of risks. Do want to be all exposed to the same kind of risk? So the best uh, funds and portfolio managers consider these things, take uh, take them into account when they where they invest, how they invest. And I'd just like to share that word with you. So until next time, uh, this has been a fun episode. This is my first solo episode. Thank you for listening and watching. And hopefully uh, we can mix in a few of these as time goes on uh, and just kind of share some of the things that we consider, uh, we've learned and uh, what we're doing. So until next time, thank you.